Welcome, everyone. Let's get dangerous. Yes. This is all good. I know. It feels so right. It's Jake Seely. Opening our minds to new ideas. Kill him. Who is that guy? Your mama. You just made the list. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. It's only fantasy, pages of the rain. So what? We talk about it all the time. Really? No. Turn. Game on, you ducks. It is all in fantasy tales of the ranks, as you just heard. And if you're listening to this, you already knew that. But uh, as a reminder, we'll give you a heads up on how to enter the giveaway to give out free and FTN memberships. And if it goes so successful, we have to give away, or I have to give away, a Madden copy for this year. I would do college football, but at that point, it's, I mean, it's already old hat. Everybody's been playing it so far. Well, everybody who pre-ordered has been playing it so far, uh, including myself. Uh, just the, the way it is, everything you can possibly want. But hopefully this show is everything you want. Uh, fantasy football gets you ready. We are still talking. Retreat or repeat or repeat or retreat, whichever way you want to look at it. Studs from 2023. Are they going to be studs in 2024? We've done all the running backs we had on our minds. A lot of the wide receivers. We're going to finish off the wide receivers today, quarterbacks, tight ends, and be done. And then upcoming after that, it'll be bonus life or game over. The opposite, those busts. And if we can hope for one more good season or uh, maybe they're just toast. Maybe they're toasty. Maybe like Chris Meany's toasty in January because he has no sleep by that point at Chris <laughs> Meany uh, because he's doing 18 billion sports, uh, the hardest working. I, I, can I, I can hand that off to you at this point, right? Because I took a, such a big step up back on baseball that I don't do in-season baseball anymore. I think I can hand off the hardest working man in fantasy sports to you now. I'd say you're still uh, you're still up there, Jake, even though you, you've you done a little bit of less baseball. I think uh, all the hard work that you've done over the years. But yeah, man, it's uh, I love getting together with you to these shows. These uh, this is what I'd like to do. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with with working with you and working hard. It's all good. Uh, the college football game, I've yet to play it, but I've seen some videos and it just looks absolutely fantastic. I've heard so many good things about the gameplay and, you know, just the. Uh, the presentation, especially, you know, with, with some of the home avenues like Penn State and the crowd and the whiteouts. And all, it just looks uh, I'm bringing I'm a national gonna... championship to ODU. I'm doing it. I'm just letting you know <laughs> it's going to happen. I believe in you. I believe in you. <laughs> uh, hopefully you believe in some of these players that like we said uh, as of today. Also, if you're watching later on YouTube, because that's how these podcasts are going forward uh, for the 2024 season podcast, you can watch later on YouTube if you are the watching type. And I didn't want to lose that personal connection with you. So we're working on and hopefully have a way where we can do like a little live kind of segment throughout the week possibly but in any case if you are watching and wondering uh do you not have anything else to wear jake yes i still have my 100 t-shirts i vastly underestimated nicole was right on that one uh somebody asked me how many i had and i was like yeah 50 to 60 and nicole's like over 100 i'm like no i think it's like 60 ish like she's like no it's over 100 went home counted it's over 100 uh so <laughs> legitimately <laughs> Uh, throughout the season, actually throughout a year, I could wear two different t-shirts per week and still just about finish going through all of them oh, because of how many nice. there are. But anyway, point being, I'm already packed up. There's nothing behind me. Uh, they're in the middle of the move. So <laughs> recording this ahead of the moving day and that's what's going on. So no, I, I did not roll out of bed and be like, you know what? I need to watch wear the exact same thing I had on the last podcast. I do shower and clean myself. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, he's I also don't. wearing the same thing. I, I, I don't. Yeah. I'm wearing the same little South Park tee, uh, rocking the same. I don't shower or clean myself at all. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk these wide receivers that we didn't get to. Uh, interesting. Three more names that I wanted to bring up, uh, repeat or retreat, and whether or not this player could repeat has a lot to do with his quarterback, but also it didn't end there. Uh, we saw Josh Downs have a breakout-ish season. Uh, you know, I said that I thought Josh Downs fits the style of Anthony Richardson a lot more, but we only got a small sample of that because what we know happened to Anthony Richardson in his rookie year got hurt. If you look at Pittman with and without him, Pittman is who we're talking about. Uh, still had over 11 fantasy points per game, still finishes a top, excuse me, top 20 wide receiver. But if you look at it, first down target percentage with Richardson without 32% to 34. EPA per target, 0.13 to 0.16. You just keep going down this list. Team target percentage is 27 to 28. Target percentage on first and second down, 30 to 32. 
third down, it's actually higher, 22 to 20. Target percentage for his routes run is about the same. I'm going down this list. Air yards, mm-hmm. team air yards, about the same. Off target percentage, actually about the same, surprisingly, 9.1 to 9. And you just keep going and keep going. And the numbers are almost identical. The only thing that's really a big difference, but it's a small sample because of it, it's 4.5% touchdowns to targets with Richardson, only 2.2 without. Now, again, very small sample. That number being skewed a little bit obviously makes a little bit of sense. But knowing that all these numbers are pretty much identical to what they were with Gardner Minshew, there's some people who would be like, well, if Gardner Minshew didn't play most of the season, this doesn't happen for Pittman. And now you, you have the addition of Adonai Mitchell or A.D. Mitchell, whichever you want to call him. So can Pittman repeat as a top 20? Because I have my hesitations, not so much because of Richardson, but because they have a multitude of options where I think Mitchell and Downs profile wise don't want to take anything away from Michael Pittman. I was in on Michael Pittman as well coming out of USC. I just think stylistically for how Anthony Richardson runs his offense, quote unquote, I have concerns that Pittman is going to get back to the targets he needs to be top 20. I don't think the targets are going to let him get there. Yeah, I agree. And and using just diving into more of the, the splits, uh, again, this tool can be found over at ftmfantasy.com. It's, it, you, you mentioned the sample size, the four games of Anthony Richardson. I mean, 8.8 targets in, in the 12 games with Gardner Minshew, 10 targets. You know, goes from 5.5 catches to 7.7, 55 yards to 77 yards, 12 points in a full PPR setting to 16, half, 9 to, to 12. So there is a, a bit of a difference there. And you mentioned like Josh Downs, like Josh Downs wasn't, you know, he's a rookie and he missed a little bit of time. And then they bring in AD Mitchell. And then Jonathan Taylor, you know, didn't play with Anthony Richardson. And this is going to be a run first offense. I think the Colts are set up to have a lot of success in the future. I believe in Shane Steichen as a play caller. And I think everybody's going to slot in nicely. Like Pittman is the short intermediate guy. Downs can play some slot. Uh, A.D. Mitchell is like going to see a lot of one on one. He and he, he definitely is because boxes are going to be stacked thinking about Taylor and thinking about Anthony Richardson. And it's it's going to be nice to, to see that type of player inside that offense because I just didn't think that they had that last year. So you could see some shots down the field with some RPOs to A.D. Mitchell. But, yeah, I, I think that the, the volume is just not going to be there. Right. We're saying we like Pittman as a player. He's a really good player. Uh, but I, I just think that with Taylor and Richardson as year two here, it is going to be run first. They play up tempo. They play fast, mm-hmm. they play quick, which is nice. Uh, but there was times where he was just the guy there, right, for Minshew. And I just – it's it's a bit of a steep price for me. I think he's more of a wide receiver three this year. I'm with you, and I think that's why uh, you see in my ranks I actually have Michael Pittman lower than most everybody. Uh, in the wide receiver three conversation with Malik Neighbors and Christian Kirk and Terry McLaurin, I think that's just where he is at this point. And people like, I think Terry McLaurin's the good example in that range. You know, Terry McLaurin has Jaden Daniels as a rookie. Could he be much higher and better than that? Absolutely. But we don't know definitively that Pittman's going to be the first, sorry, uh, McLaurin's going to be the first read for Daniels. Uh, right. Maybe he doesn't have a first read. Maybe he makes both he and John Dotson better. Like yeah. We would love that. I mean, did this sure. LSU, we're talking about Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. Uh, but I think that's a fairer range for Pittman. So it looks like neither of us are going to have much, if at any, of Pittman this year because he's still going inside the top 20, even pushing like that 16th, 17th spot, yeah. which we're, we're both out on that. So let's see if maybe we're both in on this one because this wide receiver finished lower and this wide receiver is kind of going right in the range that he finished last year. Actually still even a little bit worse, which is surprising, but I think it has to do with where he's going and where he came from. Uh, he actually is staying in the same division. <laughs> he just went from Jacksonville to Tennessee. He That is Calvin Ridley going from the one slash two with the Jaguars to, is he one slash two with the Titans? I think that's part of the question is yeah. Hopkins still definitively the number one. Is Calvin Ridley good enough that this is similar to what we just saw, that it's a one slash two situation, whereas he was the one more than the two with the Jaguars and likely more the two than he is the one. It's still not that big of a difference for somebody who was wide receiver 25 in fantasy points per game last year. I don't think a lot of people realize that because he did have a thousand yards, did have eight touchdowns. There was the inconsistency. There was the Zay Jones talk of whether or not Zay Jones is playing and whether blah, 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 blah. But Hopkins for all intents and purposes, 29th 
uh, didn't have a bad year, but is definitely trending down. He's definitely like on the cusp of finishing things out. So just on points per game, the repeat would be Calvin Ridley is better than DeAndre Hopkins in 2024. Do you think that repeats? This one's tough for me because I we both like Brian Callahan and we think that Will Levis is set up to have some success this year, you know, bring in Calvin Ridley and, and Tyler Boyd and and Tony Pollard, just like playmakers, surrounded around playmakers. But I, I think that I think that Calvin Ridley would probably take a bit of a step back because even as bad as Trevor Lawrence was, like it's it is a downgrade at the quarterback position. And you still have Hopkins, like you said, right? And you had these two backs that are going to catch out of the backfield. And you have Tyler Boyd, who's going to be familiar with the system, you know, as a third down. He was the best third down wide receiver in Cincinnati, you know, the past couple of years with Brian Callahan. So is is he? he's definitely going to be used, I think, in the slot. So uh, this is a we talked about Green Bay and, you know, in the previous episode and a crowded wide receiver room trying to figure it out. I think this is very similar, but the price tags seem to be a, a little bit more rich for Ridley and Hopkins compared to some of the, the green Bay guys. I say that Hopkins still has one more year of like not elite production, but being the guy, like I would say he has, I know Ridley's going ahead of him and he probably has the higher ceiling at this point, but I would say that Hopkins is the better value. I think that the production could be pretty similar. I think the target share can be pretty similar and he may just turn out to be, the guy that is more reliable for Will Levis is last year, you know, great season for Calvin Ridley, right? His first season in quite some time with the suspension and, and whatnot. He struggled with some drops, but he was among the leaders in like end zone targets and red zone targets. Is that going to be the case in, in Tennessee? I don't know. I'd say that Hopkins is probably going to be the go-to guy inside the red zone. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a tough wide receiver room for me to, to figure out. And I, I know I want pieces of Will Levis and I'd like to get some sort of stack in there, but Hopkins seems to be the guy that I get the most shares of. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because that was actually my next point. He was actually third in the league in red zone targets at 26. Ridley? The only two, yeah. The only two wide receivers. And I thank you for clarifying that the only two wide receivers in front of him were CD lamb with 31 Devonte Adams with 29. And then yeah, third in front of Tyreek Hill, Calvin really had 26 red zone targets. Also more interestingly, if that's the, good way to put it uh i think this is the surprising one did you know that he was first overall in end zone targets first ahead of cd lamb he had 24 end zone targets 23 for cd lamb here's the problem he caught five of those red zone targets for touchdowns <laughs> yeah. and then seven of the end zone ones so by the way you can a red zone target will be the same as an end zone target for that overlap to understand like how, he sure. didn't have 12 touchdowns so for, for everybody out there uh, but the end zone target is he's his feet are already in the end zone which is obviously in the red zone but you get the point um so he he did go 24 for seven uh cd lamb was 23 for eight mike evans was 20 and 10 dk metcalf was 19 and six so outside of mike evans he's pretty much in the range of where yeah. you should be for the end zone targets it was the red zone it's all the ones where he was in the red zone, but not in the end zone. And then he only caught five of those for touchdowns for 26. My, meanwhile, like CeeDee Lamb was 31 and 10. Uh, Cortland Sutton was Sutton. I don't know why I said Sutton. Like, <laughs> Cortland Sutton. Cortland uh, Sutton. <laughs> he caught eight of his 17. So a little bit better success there. All that being said, here's another interesting one in this whole conversation of Ridley and breaking him down. Did you know that Christian Kirk, barely, Christian Kirk had a higher percentage of 20 plus yard receptions than Calvin Ridley did? It was 22.4 for Ridley, which I thought was a higher number than I expected. And then Christian Kirk, which was also a higher number than I expected, was 22.8. And I bring that up because DeAndre Hopkins was 20 on the nose, not Will Levis for the entire season. But just thinking of what is Hopkins at this point, who is Ridley, we know Will Levis likes to take shots downfield. That's part of the appeal that we like him for fantasy, especially under Callahan. So does that, all those numbers, the red zones, the end zones, the 20 plus receptions, like all of those help the argument for Ridley in your mind. Because if you told me repeat ahead of Hopkins, I would say there's a case for it, but I wouldn't want to bet on it. I think they could be very much neck and neck, which isn't a bad thing. And it doesn't, and we're not straddling the fence. It's just, I think they're both going to be in that mid low wide receiver two range, which is perfectly fine. 
It is, yeah, and especially if Hopkins can, because he's not getting drafted as a wide receiver too. And if he could put up some low end wide receiver two numbers alongside Calvin Ridley, like this offense may be okay. Well, Levis, like we've been saying, maybe a decent number two uh, super flex guy for you that you're playing week in and week you know out. That was insane to me that you bring that up. Sorry to jump in, but no, uh, why, DeAndre Hopkins has wide receiver thirty in my ranks, which feels disrespectful. Yeah. Is ten over consensus, like, right? This and ADP this is why I'm getting a lot of shares of Hopkins because he's like you said, roughly wide receiver 38, 39, 40 off the board. I think a lot of the things that you're saying, like, and especially with Ridley, too, like he's, he's younger, he's he's fresher. You're talking about the deep ball, like, I think those would belong to him. Like, I think he can get down the field uh, a lot quicker than DeAndre Hopkins at this point, at this of, his point career. of Hopkins' yeah. career, right? So, like, that does benefit. A guy like Calvin Ridley. As we talk about the <laughs> you know what? targets, I'm thinking about who's getting them all in Jacksonville. That's exactly where mine is going right now. Like, <laughs> That's a, Brian he, Thomas. Like, like, yeah, like um, this guy who led the nation in touchdowns last year. Is he going to get all those end zone targets? I mean, probably. I'm going to have so much Brian Thomas. Davis more for, for Ingram. You know what's yeah, funny? Is, is Completely story. sidebar and has nothing to do with anything because nobody can really do this. But the mock draft we were doing for The Athletic, I was sitting there in the third round and I'm looking at the board and I'm like, man, if I could trade my like third and fourth rounder for like multiple fifths and sixth, like I just want to draft like a whole bunch of people in the fifth and sixth round and not the like, I feel like I'm reaching on the third and fourth rounds where all these values are sitting in the fifth because they're all in the same tier. They're all in that same right. group. Um, to go back to this actual conversation, you, you made a joke about Brian Thomas and just looking at these ranks and everything like that. It's just, it's baffling to me. So I'm going to throw out the Hopkins. For, oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to take one more step back. You know how everybody says, who's this year blank? Like, who's this year's Nakua? Who's this year's Kyron Williams? Who's this year, whatever, uh, De Devon Achan? Who's this year's Mike Evans? I feel like could be DeAndre Hopkins. He's 32, already turned 32. Mike Evans is about to turn 31. Now, granted, that's two years-ish, a year and a half. It does matter. And I say two years because Evans happened last year. Mm -hmm. But if you're telling me with a new quarterback, quote unquote, it wasn't for the entire, you, you get my point there. Yeah. But a new offensive coordinator, oh, by the way, Baker Mayfield, Buccaneers, which just kind of happened over there, the overhaul over there. Like, this feels like Hopkins could be, it could only be 1,000 yards, but you're telling me who is he turning to? And I know Ridley was for Jacksonville, but I don't think that lines up with what Hopkins brings. I think Hopkins could be that thousand yards, eight touchdowns, nine touchdowns guy in this year's Mike Evans. Not yeah. I'm not calling him a wide receiver one. No, but Mike Evans was drafted as the in the seventh round four, last year. Three. And yeah, in in as in the thirties, right? Nobody him and Godwin were guys like that were just there in the seventh and eighth round and nobody really knew what to do because Brady was Godwin was going ahead of Evans in a lot of places. That's crazy. Uh, Evans was this, one of the biggest steals in drafts last year, and he's still not getting respect this year. Like, he's going a little bit earlier, wide receiver 17, 18. I think he's a wide receiver one, like somebody that you can get uh, a couple rounds later than where he Mike Evans will end up. or Garrett Wilson. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I, I think I would just take Mike Evans. I think like I would just take Mike Evans and just be like, you know what? All these questions that everyone had last year about Baker Mayfield, they were all answered. Right? I knew it's an, I know it's a new OC, but Mike Evans is just doing this year in and year out. We're just expecting Garrett Wilson too. I believe in the talent of Garrett Wilson, but we're just we're just yes. hoping. Like if you draft Garrett Wilson, you are hoping that Aaron Rodgers plays a full season because if not, you are getting the same thing that you had last year. With well, you're hoping for two things. Before. So it's interesting. I got dinner with my buddy earlier this week, and he was like, I know you're keeping Garrett Wilson. You think he can be top 10 this year? And I was like, eh. And he's like, really? I was like, well, here's why. Two years of Garrett Wilson. And guess, let's clearly state, it's been as bad as it could be a quarterback. Like, really, 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 really bad. That being said, the numbers haven't been terrible. Thousand yards. No. Touchdowns are a concern. But my point is, yes, he's going to be better with Aaron Rodgers. Yes, Aaron Rodgers can get him 8, 9, 10 touchdowns. However, Garrett Wilson has to climb four fantasy points per game. Four fantasy points per game just to get to the bottom end, as in wide receiver 12. He need five to get definitively inside the top 10. And that's because like, I'm not saying it can't happen, but now let's multiply that and take the four over 17 games to give you better. That's almost 70 fantasy points better than what he's done. 
And he's already had 160 to 70. He has to get that much better. And I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying that's a very large leap. It is. And the way he does so is what you said. Like Aaron Rodgers gets him to eight or nine touchdowns. Like that's that's the way. Because all those wide receiver ones, these guys are they're scoring 10 touchdowns, right? They're also getting 1,200 yards and you know flirting with 100 catches. So th- those things Garrett Wilson can do, catches and yards with Aaron Rodgers, the touchdowns, right? He's going to have to score, and I think he could. Like, I but I, again, I was, I was in Devontae last Adams, eleven hundred and eight. Wrong. He could do yeah, that. He could do that but, for sure. Right. And he can knock on the door as wide receiver, as wide receiver one. But yeah, back to Tennessee. I don't know, man. Like, I just think Hopkins is the is the value, right? He's he's the discount inside the Tennessee room. So somebody who had a lot of touchdowns and did not reach a thousand yards, actually, he didn't reach nine hundred yards. Actually, actually, he didn't even reach 800 yards. Last year, Cortland Sutton, 59 receptions, 772 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Got him as wide receiver 30. Oh, by the way, if you want to talk about fancy points per game, ahead, <laughs> tied. I was about to say ahead. It was fractured depending on which side. 10.4 for all intents and purposes. You round off. 10.4 fantasy points per game for Cortland Sutton and Garrett Wilson. Did it in completely opposite ways. 772 and 10, 1,042 and 3. Just to give you the idea of what touchdowns can do. So, repeat or retreat. And I don't, look, I don't want your answer to be this because I know what the answer is. The, the repeat or retreat, we're all retreating the touchdowns. I don't think sure. even with the quarterback change, like, even if it wasn't there, even if it would, the quarterback change was better, I don't think we'd be saying 10 touchdowns likely to repeat. But I do want to take this and say, can he repeat as a wide receiver three? Because that's all we're asking. He was only a wide receiver three last year. We're only asking him to be a wide receiver three again, even with Bo Nix. And I say with Bo Nix because please, Broncos fans and organization, GM, everybody included, you want Bo Nix to win this job. You do not want to find out that Bo Nix could not beat out Stidham and Zach Wilson. Like that is worst be case beyond worst case scenario. So hopefully for your sake, it is Bo Nix. But that being said, I just need Quilton Sutton to be wide receiver 30. Repeat or retreat. Because I'm repeating. It, like, it doesn't take much to get 35. And I will take him as my wide receiver four. Yeah, and, and nobody nobody really wants him, right? Because no, um, nobody Denver wants to get saddled with the this quarterback. Team. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really it, man. It's the quarterback play. It's Sean Payton, you know, uh, Cortland Sutton. I, what I like is that he's been able to stay on the field over the past three years, right? There was the the injury that he had in 2020, and you know he's battling through some things after. But he's really been on for the most part. He's been on the field 15, 16 games, and they had the 17 in, in 2021. I, I'd say like we probably see more targets from him, like 90, 90 targets, 59 grabs. I, yep. I think that the touchdowns come down because of Russ was, it, it, we, we got that in year two. We didn't get it in year one, but it was a connection that I thought would be a good one. And we saw it last year, especially you just talked about red zone targets and end zone targets earlier, that there was a connection there. Uh, the touchdowns will come down because of the quarterback play. But I also think at the same time, you know, with no Jerry Judy there and other questions like is Mims ready to break out? Franklin played with Knicks, but, you know, he's a rookie. And what's that look like? Uh, so there's like a lot of question marks at the wide receiver position. But I think I could probably say with confidence that this guy's getting 100 targets. Like if he plays a full season, he's getting more than 90 targets is like the clear go to guy to lean on, especially as a rookie quarterback. Let's lean on the veteran in Cortland Sutton here. He's always going to be on the field. He's running routes. He's playing all the snaps end zone threat, of course. Uh, so I say, yeah, repeat. Let's give him more catches. Let's give him more targets. Let's give him maybe lives in the 800 yard range, 850. Give him five, six touchdowns. He's just wide receiver three. Yeah, that's, that's wide receiver three who you're getting wide receiver four. Like, that's oh, the yeah. best part about yeah. it. Yeah. You know what the insane thing is? Is I forget the exact number, but I pulled it up towards the end of last year. I think the only other player besides George Kit or before, yeah, it was George Kittle. Um, I want to say it was top 50. It was something like there was only two players inside the top 50 in team target percentage. Top 50 team target percentage to not have 100. And it was George Kittle. I think they both actually had 90 targets, right? I'll pull up George Kittle real quick. Let's see how I think so, yeah. Is. Yeah, 90. They, both, they were the only two without 100-plus targets. It was Kittle. For all intents and purposes, like 
Kittle and Sutton were again. It's the Garrett Wilson versus Sutton it's argument. It was like all sure. the yards and no touchdowns. I know, and even when you look at this team as a whole, you see Samaj Perine had, had fifty catches. I think that was second or third on the team. Like, is it nine fewer than Cortland Sutton? Is that something Which that we just expect insane. to happen? Like, it's weird. No, yeah, it's, well, all these running backs are going to get touches, but Sutton's the clear, clear number one target in that offense. Well, since we're talking about tight ends, we might as well go there. And there's only four that I brought up on the list. Uh, There are four for the future list of bonus life or game over for tight ends. But I think the most obvious one is Sam Laporta, who took everybody by surprise, no matter how, like, walking into a perfect situation. Sure. No problem. We agreed. There was a chance. The funny thing is, is if you remember Meany this time last year, it wasn't Sam Laporta that was the number one rookie tight end. Sam Laporta wasn't even number two. We sat on this very, sh- well, not this very show because it was a different name last year, but we sat on the show and said, if you like Kincaid, if you like blank, why not also Sam Laporta? Like he should be in this conversation because he's walking into, and hindsight being 2020, a lot of people forgot that that was the case. A lot of people are like acting like, oh yeah, we knew. No, Sam Laporta was a whole tier after Kincaid. Who's the other rookie? It was Kincaid, somebody else, and then Laporta. I'm trying to remember. Like, see, I can't remember this time last year who was the second. Musgrave got a little bit of love. It wasn't uh, Musgrave. I don't think it was super high. Um, It wasn't Mayer. It was somebody in between. Michael Mayer was kind of like the late teens. But anyway, point being is it it, it was an enormous gap if you looked at ADP last year, and then it was Laporta. Musk no, because Musgrave was in that group with Laporta. But anyway, point being, it's funny that people change. What like just oh yeah we could we saw no nobody saw this coming and nobody saw it even being number one in fantasy number two I think people didn't realize that either in fantasy points per game point one behind Travis Kelsey like right there all that being said um, actually technically point two and he was third behind Hawkinson because I think Hawkinson leaps frog leapfrogs him if you're talking about points anyway wait a minute Laporta can he finish as top two? I'll even give you second place. He can finish as one or two. Is he going to repeat as one or two? Because I feel like the consensus is there's no question that's going to happen. I actually think, yeah, I think he can. I think okay. maybe we dropped the touchdown. I'm with you. Maybe he doesn't score 10, but this is an offense I believe in, right? The whole band is back together. OC, coaching staff, Jared Goff playing in a dome 14 times this season. I do expect a, an upgrade from you know, Jamison Williams, I expect, you know, a little bit of a breakout, but I don't think he's going to be a, a massive target hog. Uh, I think that the offense is going to run through Amon Ra and Laporta through the air. And then, of course, you got Gibbs and Montgomery running the ball in the backfield. But, yeah, I, I believe in the talent. Uh, I think Jared Goff is is getting disrespected, you know, in fantasy. He's really turned his career around, man. It was just kind of like, yeah, let's get rid of this guy, Detroit. Oh, they'll use him for a year and then, He'll draft somebody else, but then they paid him the contract, and he's been great over the past couple of years, you know, especially at home. So, I, I yeah, I think that he can repeat. I mean, we give him eight touchdowns, but 120 targets, 86 grabs, shy 900 yards. Those are things that I think he can do again. He's he's just, uh he's he's a really good player. What if I told you you have to repeat as tight end one? So, like, I know he wasn't in fantasy points per game, so like you can look at that. But what if I told you he has to be tight end one again? Does he repeat? I do have him at one, uh, but okay. Kelsey, I'm not writing Kelsey off. Uh, I still like that wouldn't shock me if Kelsey like these guys are on a tier by, uh, with each other. Like that would be tight end one tier for me. It would be Laporta and Kelsey. I do think there's a bit of a gap uh, between those two and, and the other guys to follow like Andrews McBride and Pitts and Kincaid. So I, I think that he could. Yeah, he could finish his tight end one again. Kelsey. Obviously, he's getting a little bit older. I like the fact that they got some deep threats in, inside the offense because it was just much easier for defenders to actually defend Kelsey and KC because they weren't explosive, right? So getting Hollywood Brown, maybe Worthy, right? these guys can stretch the field a little bit, and it's tougher to bracket Kelsey and double Kelsey. And, you know, there's some talk in Kansas City about him being on the the quote-unquote, like, uh, like basketball, you know, the, uh, what do they call it basketball, basketball the... Uh, um, load management crap. Like he played fewer <laughs> snaps and they scaled him back at, towards the end of the season, right? It was all but the big picture here for Kelsey. Like he could have set the tight end record of like another thousand yard season. He only needed like a handful of yards and he didn't even suit up the final week of the season. And then when we got to the playoffs, what happened? We saw the Kelsey that we were used to seeing and snaps were there and he was just 
amazing <laughs> in those four <laughs> playoff games. But I, I do think that Laporta is worthy of being tight end one again. Okay. And I think he's tight end two. So, I mean, repeat, but You're like, Kelsey. yeah, I, I would go back to Kelsey another year. Again, he was better in points, fantasy points per game. So I'm going to take that. And that was his worst year. But last year, like, it can be both things for every year that people have been with me. I argue against Kelsey in the first round every single year. And 50-50, it's been some years have been like, hey, you're wrong. He was that much better than all the other tight ends. And then my argument of why not is because of what you sacrifice at other positions. And if he is only on the tier with Andrews that one season, with Waller that one season, with Laporta last year, you lost all that and then doubly lost because you went after that investment. And again, you didn't kill your team. It's just that's why I never did Kelsey in the first round, but I never cared if you did. Uh, I did look back. So this time last year, it was Kincaid, Mayer, well, it was Kincaid, Gap, Mayer, smaller Gap, and then Laporta and Musgrave. By the time we got to the beginning of the season, late August, it was still Kincaid, Gap, but then it was legit Laporta, Musgrave, Meyer, Mayer, back to back to back. So I just wanted to bring that up for and what was he like? Ted at 17, 18, roughly? 20. Probably Laporta. Wow. Looks. You want to know who went in front of, at this time, or not this time, August time last year in front of Laporta? Knox, Everett, Juwan Johnson, Tyler Higby, Kincaid at 15. Dulcich was at 14. Akonku, 13. Like, oh that's my. who this is. I had a couple shares of Laporta, but I remember in my home league picking him up off the waiver wire after like week three or four. I'm like, wow, this guy shouldn't be on the waiver wire. Like, I had seen enough at that point for him to be like, I, I could see like he could actually be serviceable as a starting tight end in, in fantasy this year. Uh, he had a couple of quiet moments, but man, did he ever go off in the second half? If I told you auction happy. wise, just to throw a different kind of spin on this, if I told you you could keep um, Laporta for 15 or Kincaid for 10, which would you do? I would do Kincaid. You think they're that close? Yeah. I, okay. think I just five, wanted to kind of throw that as a thought. $5 difference. I think the breakout, I think Kincaid could have a, like, I could see this guy eight plus touchdowns and you've already said he could be the number one quote yeah, unquote receiver. I, I, I could, the it's not a bull take, but I could see him finishing his tight end one or two or three for sure. Like I'd rather have him than McBride. And I think I'm leaning Kincaid over Andrews too. It's not no disrespect to Andrews. I just no. believe that the breakup will have. I like yeah. you preface that with it's not a bold take because it's not like our, our good friend, Michael Florio, not that Michael for the other Michael Florio uh, for the NFL network over on their fast. He's like, I don't know if this is bold, but Trey McBride could be the tight end one. I was like, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not as ten three pick forty five. It's not like it's not bold. Yeah, like, it's, <laughs> yeah, somebody that's going is like Dalton Schultz is a tight end one is bold. Like <laughs> Dallas Goddard tight end one. That stuff is bold. But yeah, guys that are going that early is not. But yeah, Kincaid could lead this the Bills in every category, and that would Daniel be Bellinger tight end one. <laughs> yeah, that's a bold take. <laughs> that's a stupid take. All right, uh, next tight end. I think everybody would lean to this is not a repeat. So I'm gonna kind of change this a little bit so number two in fantasy points last year even in front of kelsey again a difference in the games played but evan ingram was number two last year evan ingram points per game sixth still really good i think everybody is taking the under you look at this team ridley's gone but they added gabe davis and then drafted brian thomas some like this shows we are brian thomas fan beyond fans like huge brian thomas fans so that being said, we think he'll slide back, but do you think he'll retreat enough to fall outside the top 10? Because I think the tight end position, it's just not going to happen. Like, even if you told me Evan Ingram does not lead tight ends and targets and falls back 20, down to 120, 123, like Njoku had last year, I still put Evan Ingram inside the top eight, just because it's tight end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think he could have a very similar season. Actually, he's a uh, he's a target of mine, and I'm uh, kind of surprised that he's going as like tight end eight. And I know like uh, who could he leapfrog? Like because Kittle's so efficient. well. Let's play it. You know what? Let's do it. New show, but things don't change. It's part of the intro. What do we do when we're trying to figure out where a player would rank versus other players, and be like, well, will we take this one or this one or this one or this. One? What do we do, Chris? I don't know. What do we do, Jake? We make a list. And that's what we're going to do. Let's Whether see. you go one or two, Kelsey Laporta, one or two. Whether you go three or four, McBride, Andrews, Andrews, McBride, those are the top four. Yeah. I think uh, the conversation after that, five and six, Kittle and Pitts, Pitts or Kittle, like we're not arguing them, right? No. 
I just don't. So then it comes down to number seven. Who's your boy, Dalton Kincaid, unless you want to push Kincaid higher. So boom, done. I just, I made the list. That might be the fastest list in the history of us ever being together. How can you put Ingram higher than eight? You can't. You, that's what I was saying. Like, <laughs> I feel like he's getting disrespected at pick 84 or 78 on average. So he like, can be disrespected overall. Yeah, I just think he's a good but, target. You know, I just think okay. he's a good target. Like, a, if you don't want to take the elite, like, I'm with you. I don't, I like Laporta. I like Kelsey. I don't want to take them. I mean, I would say Ingram over McBride, personally. I th- that's what, that's the one guy that I would say I, I feel really like could have a better season than McBride. Yeah, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just hating. I just feel like all, like, people are Such just, d- they're just diving into that small sample size at the end when it was just McBride. Like, there was no Hollywood, there's no Wilson. Now you're adding, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. There, I don't know. It's just it just seems like a really steep price to to pay, and it, it kind of bothers me <laughs> because then we have a guy like Ingram who you mentioned the targets, man, like 143 targets, 114 grabs, like and a lot of those were short yardage stuff. I mean, there's talk in Jacksonville they want to get him, you know, down the field more. Like in in the in the Giants early on, there was no Odell Beckham Jr. That one year, like he was a touchdown machine. Like this guy was getting some some targets in the end zone. We yeah. just talked earlier about Calvin Ridley and all those targets. Do so they all go to to rookie Brian Thomas and and Gabe Davis? I, I still th- like there's a rapport there, and I think that Ingram is going to lead the team in targets and is going to lead the team in catches in Jacksonville this year. So maybe we can't bump him up. Maybe he's still in that tier with like all those guys Can that I- we brought up, but. He's a hell of a target. If you don't want to go elite yes. tight end, you want to target the tight end position in the middle rounds of your draft. Like that's a guy that is very interesting to me, especially if you play PPR. Well, let me kind of turn two different discussions out of this. Uh, first, being the mock that we did, so Kelsey and Laporta went in the third round. I have no problem with Kelsey there in the third round. Like that's like the- now you're going to tell me I can get Kelsey in the third? I'll sign yeah. up for that all day long. Third over second in, for sure. Yeah, in the fourth. Andrews by himself. The fifth included McBride, Pitts, Kincaid, Kittle. So now a full round later than all of those, that's when Ingram went. So I'm with you in the fact that like, if you're going to tell me I can wait all the way to the sixth or seventh, possibly even because he was at the, he was the very last pick of the sixth. Mm -hmm. You can tell me I can wait that long and get Ingram. Absolutely. Because there's no reason like the gap between Laporta and Kelsey to him it's going to be there, but is it enough for it to be a three round discount? I don't think so. So that's where I'm with you on this. And then if you're going to tell me I can get him at a round and a half cheaper than McBride or Pitts, again, I'd mu- and we disagree, but I'd much rather have McBride and Pitts. Like mm-hmm. I, I have a lot of Pitts already so far this year. But again, if I can get that discount. So that's why I think the point being is he's disrespected overall, but not necessarily at the position on his own. The second part of this has nothing to do with fantasy. But in my opinion, if Trevor Lawrence is going to be Trevor Lawrence and the Jaguars are going to be what the Jaguars fans in the organization want them to be, Evan Ingram can't be your target leader this year. <laughs> I, I do agree with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you made me I, yeah. think of that. I'm like, could lead the team. Like, then they're not succeeding. And Trevor Lawrence I, yeah, is I, I, now a bust at this point. I, 100% agree with you there, right? Like, let's push the ball down the field. Let's l- use the new shiny weapons there. Kirk is still a really good wide receiver. Like, Ingram's a nice safety valve for you, Trevor Lawrence, but let's throw the ball down the field, right? You got a nice arm. Like, let's not be throwing it to the, the short yardage throws to Ingram. These check down plays, like, it shouldn't. Maybe that's why the offense was so vanilla last year. But I just think it's very important to, like, there's a drop off after Ferguson. Like I like Njoku as a player, but th- I think getting one of those top nine tight ends, any one of those. Well, let's talk Njoku Pretty for good. the setup for that. Is there, I'm going to spin this question completely different because everything went right for Njoku to have his breakout season. And you look at Njoku last year, points per game seventh, higher overall because again, games played, but even points per game seven. Let's talk about how the season started, though. Three targets, four targets, four targets, seven, four, nine, eight, six, nine, 15, nine, 16, eight, 14, nine, eight, 11. Oh, what happened in that strange range where he went from scoring three to eight points per game to all of a sudden scoring 15, 11, nine, eight on the bad weeks, 24. Oh, that's right. 
Joe Flacco became the quarterback. Is there any world to change this question for you, Meany? Career highs in targets, career highs in receptions, yards, touchdowns, fantasy points per game. Is there any possibility that he repeats? Because I think it's a zero chance. Yeah, I, just the way that Watson, I don't know, like when you look at the splits, you you mentioned some of the other numbers, like 5.8 targets, 4.2 catches, and 38 yards. That's what he averaged with Sean Watson. They played six games. You basically double that. He did. Flacco. Nine targets, 5.7 catches, and 67 receiving yards. You're right. He basically doubled it. And this offense completely changed. They went from a run first squad, of course, with Nick Chubb, who suffered the injury in week two. They were still kind of run heavy a little bit. And then Watson suffered the injury. The guy they paid all this money to. And they said, <laughs> oh, you know what? Now that he's gone, let's just pass the football more with 40-year-old Joe Flacco. And they were among the leaders in pass attempts. And it like, worked. It, it pass percent, and it <laughs> did work. Amari Cooper was getting double-jet tar- targets. And Joku was getting down the field. You could see that he was a mismatch. Right? It, it, it looked like a much better offense. Now, if Chubb comes back and Deshaun Watson, does like Stavansky and company say, Maybe we will just throw the football a little bit more. I, I I don't think they will. And then you add Jerry Judy. So, no, I don't think that Njoku can have the same season. This is not on the player. I think we can both agree he is a mismatch. You could see it. You could see why Flacco wanted to get him the football, right? And especially down the stretch of the season. And then even in that playoff game that they lost against the Texans, like Njoku had 100 yards in, I like, think, the first two drives of that game. And he was just <laughs> getting open and making plays. Maybe Cleveland realizes, hey, like let's use the use him a little bit more. Hey, Watson, we're gonna like let's lean on Injoku, but it's tough for me to think that he's gonna be able to put up similar numbers. I, I get it's a bit of a small sample size of the six games, but I would say no, and that's why he's he's fallen. Like if it's so weird to say, like if Joe Flacco was the starter and you knew the offense was gonna be the same, and you knew Nick Chubb wasn't gonna play until what week ten, I'd feel a lot better about Injoku. Does it make you feel any slightly different than the Ken Dorsey middle of the season change as offensive coordinator? Like maybe it's not just Joe Flacco. Maybe it's the offense. Because if you're looking at it too, like objectively, we know this about Deshaun Watson. We know this about the injuries and Joe Flacco being a quarterback and that wide receiver room last year. But this wide receiver room this year is now Amari Cooper, Jerry Judy, and Elijah Moore. And like, Jerry Judy being in the mix. I mean, maybe Judy's a bust at this point, but it's a significant factor to add that to the mix over Cedric Tillman, who a lot of people are like, ooh, maybe he can make a little bit of noise. But uh, the one thing I will say about Browns, they do an amazing job of trading for wide receivers at like bargain basement prices. Yeah, buying low on Amari Cooper, buying low on Elijah Moore, buying low on Judy, all three being if like they did nothing with the Browns, it would have been like, you know what? It was worth the risk at that cost. Cooper has been a massive return on value. But Judy and Moore, and now you're looking at that three, where if you would take this back four years from now and went back to 2019, like getting some college involvement, but sure. talent wise, it would be like, there's no way you're going to have these three on one team. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. But you have these three. You have, again, Dorsey halfway through and the David and Joku. Is there anything that you can say, like, well, maybe the wide receivers are just not going to be as involved as we think? Maybe it's Cooper and Joku and a mix of somebody else because of what Dorsey wants to do versus Alex Van, Van Pelt. Yeah, and, and I think that you know, it's a good point. And, and I do believe at the end of the day, it probably will be closer to Amari and Njoku as the two than maybe Amari and Judy. But I think that, uh, I think everybody's set up properly now. Like Elijah Moore is the slot wide receiver is the quote unquote number two option to start. Remember we were talking about it, you know, Deshaun Watson was targeting him a lot. I think they, in the four or five games they played together, it was like seven plus targets in, in all but one or two, but he wasn't catching any of those passes, but Judy's an upgrade in the slot. So he, I, I think that he is going to be a factor and he'll be able to give Watson and the Browns more than Elijah Moore did in that role. Uh, but I think, you know, when you look at the wide receiver room and you include Njoku, like, I think they should pass the football a little bit more. I think they should use some of these weapons. But I don't know, to answer your question, like, yeah, maybe, maybe with the change, there's some more pass attempts. I just have the hard, I have a hard time thinking that Njoku will have a, a very similar season. I, well, I, I, I think that Judy is, it could have a bounce back too. 
I'm going to say bounce back. Like he hasn't even had any, I think there's like one good season really. Uh, but a change of scenery could do him wonders. I'm just curious what Dorsey's going to try to do, because if you get the feel of the bills and what Dorsey was before getting fired, it That's feels like in the football. Yeah. But it also feels like tight end might be a little irrelevant, but also if you, I mean, you're talking about the tight ends that were at Buffalo it's kind of a hard perspective to pull in. 100%. And then, yeah. Um, Van. By the way, Van Pelt going to New England is why I'm backing out Hunter Henry a little bit. <laughs> just because also, like, eh, just, you know. Is it just me or did Van Pelt fail upwards? <laughs> like, is it? Like, like, like you yeah. kind of, like, didn't really do much with the Browns and Joe oh. Flacco was the biggest difference. And now you get to get a bump back. I, I don't know. It made me fail sideways and go over to the Patriots. I don't know. It just it felt weird. All right. Let's get out of here. Uh, something I brought up on the last episode, and we kind of went past his name here, but one of my biggest retreats, and again, it's not overall, it's huge. Schultz was 11 in fantasy points per game, so it's not a massive drop. He was also 10 overall in fantasy points, even with only 15 games. But I'm putting it this way. I'm still calling him a retreat in my book because I don't think Schultz no, not only repeats not only doesn't repeat as a tight end one, I think Schultz is down in like last year's Hunter Henry territory, mid tight end two that I just don't want because I think he becomes irrelevant with Diggs now in the mix. You have three wide receivers. Why do you need Schultz? You don't. I wouldn't be surprised if Schultz is even on the field sometimes, uh, as in like no tight end sets. I just, I am so far out on like Dalton Schultz still going just behind like the Njoku that we're talking about and uh ferguson and stuff like that like i just no no like don't put it this way if you told me dalton schultz is sitting there in the 14th round or i could take a flyer on gaseki i'd probably just take the flyer on the person who could if everything broke right finish top 10 i just don't see a world where i feel like schultz had everything break right from last year just to get to tight end 11 because tank dell missed a lot of the season yeah and that's where you saw towards the end of the season i had some best ball shares of cj stroud and and schultz and i was just like come on guys come on let's go let's keep this up <laughs> down the stretch uh i'm in total agreement of you there's two guys or with you there's two guys in dallas goddard and dalton schultz that are easy fades for me like Gal dallas goddard's a good player but the offense runs through two wide receivers he's never been a big red zone player and he's missed time over the past couple of years and then dalton schultz you add stefan Diggs, the second year of tank uh tank dell again tight end 13 like an easy fade for me cole Komet, easy fade for me like give me pat fryer for the volume give me tj hawkinson i'll wait it out you mentioned um, Gasecki, guys like Conklin, Kate Otten, likely. like These are guys that I would I'd rather just wait and, and bypass Dalton Schultz. Like the player, liked him in Dallas, looked like a, a nice red zone target for the Cowboys at that point, was a red zone target down the stretch, but you're just adding another weapon. You're right, another yep. player to this offense. Like Look at some of these games from Dalton Schultz. 11 targets, 10 grabs, it's not going to happen. 10 targets, 7 grabs, 11 targets, 8 grabs. This is very rare. I just don't think we'll see that. It's really, unless Diggs is completely toast <laughs> or a tank Dell can't recover from an injury, like things like that. And it's just a lot of ifs at that point. Like he's the fourth option up, maybe fifth because Mixon is a guy that can catch yeah, yeah, balls through the backfield. Right. There's just too many. And this feels like the old Bengals. Speaking of Mixon, like yeah. the tight end just isn't needed. It's just not no. relevant. It's just like, maybe a handful of games, but you're going to try and predict those. And that might just be like a DFS type of option for people that still play that. Right. But if you are still listening at this point, I forgot to do it earlier in the show, but let me remind everybody, if you want to get in the contest to win those FTN multiple memberships uh, or the Madden game, if we can get inside the top 10, uh, there's multiple ways to enter. You can get up to five entries. You could just do one and be done, but it's up to you. One is just to review. Again, you have to send the screenshots, Jay Seeley at The Athletic, by the way. Uh, just review the show, but if it's a five-star review, that's automatically two. If you, that's the review. If you subscribe and show that you subscribed, that's another one. And then if you tweet by itself as a full two tweets, I mean, you could even tweet, this is the worst show ever. That's why you should listen. Just include something like about actually listening to it. Because <laughs> we also found out the other reason too that we're just destroyed by the old Apple is because not only when people tried to sign up, did the podcast app actually crash uh, they did you know they changed their rules that if you don't listen within two weeks you're not considered an active su subscribing listener anymore two wow. weeks all you get is two weeks you, yeah so just do us a favor also in general 
even once you subscribe, at least listen to like 10 seconds. Just put it on, like go to the bathroom and come back or something like that. So we don't fall in the rankings this time. But anyway, uh, we love you guys at All In Kit, at Chris Meany. You can ask us a whole bunch of questions there. We'll help you out too. Meany, all his work over at FTN. I'm over at The Athletic. You can catch all that. And we'll be back for another podcast with finally different outfits because they all have moved at that point. We'll, <laughs> we'll see shower. you guys. Yeah, go shower. Peace. <laughs>